Well, our next presentation is titled Mass Surveillance versus Human Rights. We will have an update on the um, ECHR case on the surveillance um, uncovered by Snowden because we have three running um, court decisions. And our speaker is Dr. Constanze Kurt, Kurtz, who is the speaker of the CCC and who is also one of the plaintiffs in the case against the British Intelligence Service GCHQ. So please welcome Constanze Kurtz. Thank you. I'm delighted to see so many of you here, so many fans of mass surveillance. And even though Mr. Herold already said it, um, I am one of the plaintiffs in this case, and that means that I cannot speak absolutely objectively, and I clearly have a subjective position on this whole matter. And there are three main points that I would like to mention. The running um, court decisions in Strasbourg that have been running for several years and the um, act on the German Federal Intelligence Service where um, the CCC um, made a statement about the decision and I will um, try to sum up this um, decision and I will talk about the frame conditions, um, the legal frame conditions and also other frame conditions and how they differ between Britain and Germany. So what I want to talk about is the mass surveillance and interception of communication data, but um, well in Europe and there are four countries that intercept data um, in mass by accessing infrastructures that are normally um, regulated by the law. I will not talk about France, but there are also some court um, decisions being made right now. And I will talk about the GCHQ, which is um, the Secret Service for Great Britain, and which plays on a different level kind of than the other countries because they have a lot more budget and a lot more staff. So to sum up, all uh, of these countries' activities and the examples that I will mention, Germany, um, Britain and Germany, uh, um, Sweden, sorry. Um, it, it, this is a very legal topic and um, there are like holes in the legal framework. So I would like to start talking about the British case because it is a very important one for me because I am one of the plaintiffs in this case and I believe that the way it has been treated at the ECHR, um, there are good chances that there will be a decision that will be very expletive on this case. and. This uh, GCHQ is a large agency that has become kind of a symbol of mass surveillance and we know um, a lot about its activities from the Snowden Papers. But we do not have a clear program about the points that will be um, talked about in court and that the British authorities deny. And there is no case where, well, programs that were published by Snowden, where we know that it hasn't taken place or that it doesn't exist. And, of course, these programs have been named and um, representatives of the British authorities had to be confronted with those um, cases. And usually, when you start investigating in the ECHR, normally you don't have hearings 
we were lucky. We, that is a group of NGOs, the Open Rights, um, Rake Brother Watching and the Pen Collective and myself. Me being the only foreign citizen, which is important for um, what I will later talk about. And you don't expect to have an oral hero hearing, but we did have one. We ha did have prioritization and we had two hearings that I will speak about later and that is uncommon. It is different than we know it from Karlsruhe, from the German court. It is much more structured. There is no dialogue like we have in German courts, but it's very standardized. And the plaintiff, when the plaintiffs are speaking, there's, um, there's a Q&A. And then you can prepare for questions and then there's a very short Q&A session and this is what it looks like. And it's not like the court finds a decision like it is in Karlsruhe, like in the German courts, but there's a written decision. I think it's a good thing like we have it in Germany with, a, with an oral decision being made, but um, you don't have that in the European court. I would like to now present the core of the um, of our case. So Tempura has several parts and it's hard and software accessing the actual cables and then you have the MVR system which is just a huge mass of data um, where we also have um, like you porn traces that we need to like sort out and then you have um, poker face that um, clears data from mobile apps for example and then we have the very well known X key score system that connects the intercepted data. So summing up the Tempera program, summing up, um, and it has been published in 2013, and shortly afterwards we were making our complaint. But still, um, governments took very long in their decisions because um, NGOs um, had to be asked because um, the complaints were very similar and they had to be like bundled together. So let's sum up what is legal in Great Britain because there's been a new decision and the um, law doesn't exist like that anymore. So the only thing that is legal is external communications. That means um, it is foreign signals intelligence. Um, so just um, international connections, so there's a difference between inner British and international communication. You cannot um, intercept inner British communication for economic but also for technical reasons. So if they want to intercept that kind of data, um, well, it's an important question how much of the transatlantic um, communication they can actually intercept. And of course, they are in close cooperation with the NSA. So, um, you may know the statistics and diagrams. Just so you know uh, what we're talking about, those are the connections. And we have about 200 underwater cables, for example, in Cornwall, as you see here, which is like, like the core or the center of this whole system. But you also have um, networks within Great Britain because, um, of course, you need to further proce process the data. And you can see on the left the satellite station. So it's not just glass um, fiber like uh, in Germany and in other European countries. So that means you have a quick means of transport. It is Voltec like it is in Germany. Voltec means that um, you take the whole raw data stream. But well, 2013 you were talking about about 20 terabyte and sometimes they had to delete them before they could actually read them out. 
So these are the technical principles that we can base our complaint on because uh, we saw a um, conflict with the Article 8 of the Euro European Convention on Human Rights that guarantees us freedom from surveillance and um, w this kind of uh, bulk collection and this is what we founded our complaint on. This is an image of the European Human Rights Court and they have often um, taken decisions on surveillance. I have a list uh, prepared of um, decisions in that matter that you can have a look at if you want. But from 2008 until 2013, we had some cases about automatic data interception and this kind of automatic interception must be limited. Of course, I wasn't the only person who wrote this complaint. That was lawyers who were paid by um, like actually um, money that people gave voluntarily to this case. So if you read um, the complaint, um, you will also find references to the old decisions. So um, back, coming back to the whole uh, decision, there was a decision in 2018 and there was a new hearing this year. And of course you will ask yourself, how can that be? When Karlsruhe, um, like the German Constitutional Court, takes a decision that is final, but um, in Europe it is possible to have a like a complaint against the decision, and you can ask for it to hear a larger um, group of persons. And the judges accepted that, and that is why there is a second hearing. I will just uh, quickly talk about the procedure because you may not be familiar with this whole thing. It is a whole paper um, tray, so you have lots and lots of paper used by our lawyers and the um, state representatives because every plaintiff has their own lawyers. That was um, the same in the Swedish case. What you do there is just you sit there and you take notes on paper because you don't have phones and all that. And I actually wrote this on a um, <laughs> my, my note paper was actually from the German Stasi um, authority and that, that was funny. So we said that the British mass surveillance um, is in conflict with Article 8 in the ECHR. And what is interesting is that there are risks that have already been named. There is a risk that a system of secret surveillance set up to protect national security may undermine or even destroy democracy under the cloak of defending it. So those are clear words. It's a very long uh, decision. So it is about mass surveillance itself and how good the filters are working. Then it's about control. So who controls this whole mass surveillance? And who um, actually has an overview of all the technical aspects? And the third aspect is the um, huge amounts of data involved. So who, what kind of agency gives what data to other agencies and all that? So that will also be important in January in the hearing. And when we filed the complaint, there wasn't um, the act on the Federal Intelligence Service in Germany yet. So I, have, I brought you a tweet from Edward Snowden that says, for five long years, governments have denied that global mass surveillance violates of, uh, our rights. And for five long years, we have chased them through the doors of every court. Today we won. Don't thank me, thank all of those who never stopped fighting. 
So this is kind of, it seems a bit untimely because when you look at the um, actual decisions, you, you can always find loopholes. So there are conflicts with Article 8, but um, the court didn't take up all of the um, points that the NGOs made. I will name a few aspects. So it's not like I am not happy about this decision, but there are still some loopholes. So for one, um, the chamber did not um, recognize that well, in Germany, you don't have, uh, in um, Britain, you don't have um, the, um, so basically the German court uh, didn't accept this ruling um, because they are never ending. Uh, basically what we said so once, like on a factual standpoint, this is something that does not have a time limitation. Um, this interception was never interrupted. So uh, once you have this kind of piece of a glass fiber optic cable, um, this is not being turned off afterwards. And um, because this definition of why this can be happen is so vague. It's like in Germany, this is defined, like the reason or cause is defined as uh, internet, like national security. Uh, in German, to quote the German law here, it's like it depends on national security matters and those things are quite vague and like on a f from a factical standpoint this is what happened and this point of argument was good enough that the court revoked this ruling um, so these warrants um, basically never actually um, were given so in this um, one of these programs, like the program Dishfire, this um, warrant to um, run this program was actually never given. So these uh, metadata had been passed off on and, and that was not lawful to do and there was never any warrant given by the government. So this political interception in this whole process was never really taken into account. So this publication of, 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 of information and data just kept on and continued throughout the course of the uh, court case. So there was a bunch of NGOs European-wide who um, are supporting this uh, and are like signing on these petitions and that was very, meta very much to us. Um, so you can watch this video, um, these listenings, these, these hearings are always being uh, videotaped. Um, our most important case is that we are, do not just care about the telecommunication secrets anymore. Um, this is about shopping, dating, political um, activism. It's not just about telecommunication. It's about all sorts of stuff like your digital ego, your digital eye, your digital self. Um, so this kind of frame, is, it's not just about telecommunication any longer. And I think the lawyers made a really, really good case in this regard, um, orally as well as written. Um, I do have to say that the, the representatives of uh, the, um, uh, the British government, uh, ED, like, she said that, well, it was also about terrorism and national security. So um, that national security is being at threat. And But to be honest, like, there's three main reasons why mass surveillance done by Secret Service can be done is because of horrific crimes that are being committed, economic um, espionage, and so the interest of Britain's economy is, 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 is also given it a good, as a reason of why mass surveillance is legal. So, um, because I want to also get into the other cases, I want to I want to finish with the British case for now. I, I do see we're in a, in a in a good position to get a better ruling. They wouldn't have brought it in front of the big chambers if if that hadn't been the case. Um, so basically, at the moment, we're trying to um, kill the unsensible, unreasoned mass surveillance by Secret Service and data retention. And 
So interceptions that do not have any cause of being and without any having exceptions and no limitations. And this is something that we cannot have happening. And we do hope that Strasbourg court is going to uh, rule in our favor in this regard. Um, of course, I know that Secret Service is never going to um, like stop doing things like that. But what matters here is that we, uh, if we understand the European scope and the European sphere as a lawful sphere, then it does matter um, that we um, take a step. And I do see it in myself. I think all of you will know this, you, you get enraged quite quickly um, about rulings that do not please you and, and are not in line with your opinion, and I, I find them quite difficult. Um, but um, I do think it's important to push rulings that um, are going to work in our favor, and we have to look at um, how it is being politically executed. Um, I do think that it is important that there's a European, vast European public support for this. So the second ruling that we're going to get, hopefully a good one, um, the British um, are already uh, a step ahead. So from bulk surveillance, they've gone to bulk equipment interference, which is a form of bulk hacking, to be honest. As the GCHQ doesn't just want to intercept communication data, but they also want to m hack on a mass scale. You really have to say at this point that currently in England, especially the um, support from the Secret Service is quite large, and it's a bit different here, um, but they also have a different party system, and who knows. All right, so I really quickly want to talk about the Swedish proceedings, um, but I do want to talk about where the differences are. How, how the chamber will decide on this is difficult to say and predict, but um, they did put it and schedule it on the same day, so I have a feeling that they might have similar rulings. But the Swedish case is a, bit of a little bit different. It's, it's been going on since 2008, so they've, they've taken the national uh, lawful path, which well, whereas, like, on, we directly went to Strasbourg. So it's been ongoing for more than 10 years. The plaintiff in, in Sweden is like a classical litigator, and strategically, they want to like, get to a point where there's a law that um, will be set precedence for the future, basically. Oh, maybe before I can give you an overview, maybe I should say a little bit about what this is about. So mainly, what were they doing? So the glazed fiber optic cables in the Baltic Sea, um, there was a, lo a, a law that was passed in 2008. This is all about external communication that go into Sweden and leave Sweden. And they are intercepting these. It's not just about metadata. It's also about emails, SMS, and telephone calls, and the content of such. The most interesting about this is that most of Russia's communication is channeled and funneled through that. And um, so when Obama was still president, there was this um, like high stake communications and conversations about this in 2011. So when like a, a big portion of the Russian section like went into discussion with them. Um, so in this case, the um, lawful ways of legal means in um, Sweden were uh, exhausted completely, which rarely happens. So some of the plaintiffs with us have um, already also filed complaints in England, but they have an independent authorization. This does not exist in Great Britain. So in Sweden, they also have um, a law to um, communicate and they have a law of that states why surveillance is allowed to happen and under which circumstances and they have um, like a factual use of or they've restricted the use of sir and first name so it's quite important like in Germany for example we have like more of like a general kind of ruling and in Great Britain as well and in Sweden they have a qualitatively better con mechanism of control about their secret service and what does that actually mean so theoretically this exists so this is why I brought an example 
from the plaintiffs in Sweden. So all complaints that ever uh, end up with the Ministry of Justice uh, were denied without any proceedings. And um, the parliamentarian representative um, took one phone call in the past 22 years. So this form of um, control mechanism to surveil the surveillers basically or, or keep them in check is, does not actually function. So in Great Britain, there's there's no way to as a as a as a, as an independent person complain. Um, however, in Sweden, you technically can. So I don't much want to say more about Sweden um, because I find it really difficult to play oracle here. You can obviously listen into the hearing. The judges asked lots of critical questions. I do recommend uh, listening in and watching in um, and taking a look. It's quite informative. Um, the questions were the same that we also got. So I, I do believe that ruling is gonna be quite similar. Also in the Swedish case, there was a ruling last year and um, they did not get um, a determination or a statement. Um, I, I do believe that's going to change. But the law is also less vague than in, in Germany or Great Britain. All right, so let's get to the last case. I have about another 15 minutes. Um, so I have to hurry up a little bit. So the BND this is the quite uh, hot, like warming uh, new building in Berlin that lots of you might know, oh, by the way, on that note. Before, when they were in uh, central Berlin, in Berlin Mitte, they had this gigantic modern architecture. Um, they had a location in Lichterfelde, which is a bit further out to the east, um, where <laughs> architectural experts uh, wandered around the building and, and talked about um, the German Federal Intelligence Service's architectural beauty. Um, so we now have this uh, beautiful, gigantic building in Mitte, but they are also going to keep um, the like the, the location in Lichterfelde, where a large portion of technical surveillance happens. Um, so the NSA BND um, hearing was what actually made most clear uh, about mass surveillance, especially within Germany, not the Snowden papers themselves. So there is a procedure within the BND that were quite surprising, that were qu like the the quite uh, the the space theory, as it was referred to, uh, whether or not it was possible to surveil from space um, as a human. Obviously, um, this. But there's a question of is of whether the the Telecommunications Secret Act is actually being applied to every human or just Germans. So the BND uh, law that was. Um, ratified in 2016 was one of the largest reforms we've seen and it gave a much larger um, way to uh, mass surveillance and the most interesting thing about, and I'm probably gonna we're probably gonna remind about this in January so the strategic mass surveillance uh, was relatively all right because only a fraction of, of the communication was actually intercepted. But today this is quite different. And um, I, I do believe that in Frankfurt a lot is being punctuated and they're punctuating the raw data. And um, the judges that, that send a few questions wanted to know exactly this, how much of um, the, um, the signals can they intercept with um, this law? Unfortunately, we could not respond to this question <laughs> sufficiently um, because there's very rarely any publication um, of the data rate of interception that they do. Um, so the, they don't actually know how much of communication of much is, is being funneled through Europe and therefore we also cannot say um, how much is being intercepted and cut out out of the grander scheme of things. So what we can also maybe add here is like the, the practices that were legalized by this law were done before 
um, this report was released. And the, so that basically there was a report that was released that we're looking into their um, actions while this law was being passed, which is quite ironic to think of. So the focus of this complaint against the constitu like this constitutional complaint that it's mainly about um, foreign foreign interception, which means that you're spying on foreigners abroad. Um, so in Germany, we differentiate between um, internal and foreign um, exchange and foreign foreign exchange. So the BND law is, so there's also internal, internal, like in, inner country, inner country, um, which is what is being filtered with a so-called G10 filter. So this, um, so they're obviously asking themselves, like, how good are the filters? Like, are they actually filtering out um, German citizens because the BND is not allowed to actually surveil German citizens as that is against the constitutional uh, fundamental rights? Um, I have another slide about this, uh, and I want to reference it, something else. Um, I brought another thesis from our um, President Steinmeier. He used to be the head of the chancellor's office, and he is responsible for um, this unlawful practice of the BND um, that has passed on raw data. And I would like to quote him here while asked about this. Um, it is like me, um, I, I feel exactly like you as uh, the head um, of uh, that, that, that the BND was passing on uh, information to um, friends uh, on the international scale, I was quite surprised myself, which is quite shocking when you think about it. And I think it does make very clear the the mechanisms of control are quite weak also within Germany, and that especially the fact that this mechanism of control is so weak that there's so many um, unlawful practices happening within the Secret Service. So I think there's new ways of um, control that are being established. Uh, like there's like a three BGH judges that are supposed to be independent and they're supposed to review cases of foreign foreign uh, surveillance. So, um, but there's, based on the law that was passed recently, uh, the BND can get, like, go into action without having a foreign, uh, a proper warrant uh, to do so. So, Susanne Annafeld talked about the um, proceedings at the Constitutional Court and representatives of the ECOM in Frankfurt had this slide that um, shows what we're talking about when we're talking about the filters and if they are able to distinguish between inner country and external communications. And the quality of the filter was calculated and well, of course, um, these numbers are higher, meanwhile. I think at the moment we're at about 6 terabyte peak, So, but the scale is about the same. So we're talking about years and years of wrongly filtered connections. Um, these are the connections that we um, know of, and so we don't know how well these filters are actually running. So, in this proceeding, I have um, uploaded our statement because um, we will um, publish a statement before the hearing. Uh, but if you want to preliminarily read this statement, you can do so. So if you want, you can photo take a photograph of that or um, read it online. So um, we have stated that the filters are not secure and not good enough to um, filter the data properly. And the packet-oriented data um, transfer, how it is organized, um, which is also what we looked at in um, 
a group that was supposed to look at um, how this all works. So the German Federal Intelligence Service can also surveil satellites. So it is not just about the question if the filters are good enough. So what we hope for because of um, the questions that we posted as CCC, but also to other experts. We do hope that um, for a grand uh, breaking decision. Because now, in a digitalized world, um, they kind of um, intercept raw data and in this whole data transfer, uh, you cannot just talk about um, tiny pieces because as in Great Britain, it is important for us that we're not just talking about the telecommunications secrecy, but also that our life is reflected in the, this communication. So um, how the data is filtered and how it is um, continued to use is um, a very large and important aspect of mass surveillance because um, our German Federal Intelligence Service has been caught um, passing on unfiltered data to our American friends. So they, they've been actually caught in the act, caught red-handed. So here, like in the ruling in Strasbourg, it, um, the public has a large interest in this hearing and in um, having these facts cleared up. So I do think that um, it is very important for the general public. So I brought you a picture from when the Snowden revelations were new. The image of, of um, intelligence services is um, getting better over time again. And you do realize that in 2013, we did have um, a skeptic general public towards um, mass surveillance, but um, following 2016, um, a lot more was legalized and the public interest, there was a shift in the public interest. Because you cannot, you just cannot keep the public interested for so many years because um, people just tend to accept the facts after some time. But we have had a large technical advances. This is one example um, of the encryption of uh, data traffic. I haven't found data from 2018, but um, it has even increased in 2018. You see that a large part of the um, communications traffic um, is encrypted. So it has passed um, half of like the large, um, the whole scope of data. So this um, public knowledge is much more important than any court decisions. Because, um, as we know, the GCHQ is not being properly controlled. So, I hope that there will also be technical measures on top of the court rulings to just um, limit mass surveillance. But lastly, I believe that just making court decisions will not help. It is. It will be difficult to politically um, realize all of this, um, these decisions because it will be difficult in Sweden, but in Germany we may have the chance to at least have a few fractions in parliament that want to actually implement the court decisions because um, we've had 14 rulings in Germany on the matter that had just that politics just didn't catch up with. So this won't be easy. So we all, everyone who's interested in this whole topic must um, put pressure on politics so that uh, these decisions are actually implemented. So, of course, Strasbourg is a far away and the political will 
to like implement these decision is high also in Great Britain but the public isn't interested enough so we need to propagate this whole topic more and we need to actually talk about and read about these decisions. So I would like to thank a few people um, who helped in writing the statement and I would like to thank more than 5,000 people who donated money to us and made it possible to even file this complaint against the um, European Court. I would really like to thank those people who helped pay our lawyers. Because lastly, it is thanks to you that this decision was taken. Because of course this whole court proceedings isn't a cheap affair. So, in 2013 or 14, it was easier to get all this money, and um, I would really like to thank all of those who helped. So there's many details about this proceeding. I also wrote about it, so if you are interested, you can read about it. And I've also talked about um, the hearing itself, so if you are interested in the whole proceedings, you can have um, a look at it online. And we will also publish a statement on the um, Federal Court, uh, not the Federal Intelligence Service um, Act in Germany. So I think that we have 10 minutes left for questions. Is that right? We have 20 minutes left for questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. So there's a question from the internet. Yeah, you know that um, you can ask questions into the microphone. So First question about mass surveillance in Sweden and France. Why in uh, media coverage um, there was a lot of talk about um, Great Britain uh, but not about Sweden and France? Well, I think it's because, because of the um, critical public awareness and um, there was more coverage here and also the Swedish um, proceedings was very, very elongated and there's also the language barrier, of course. Well, in Brussels, in the European Parliament, they talked about this, but there's a language barrier. As far as I can see, there's um, not as large as a European public interest as there could be. And in Sweden, the decision wasn't positive. And I didn't think that they would be able to even speak before the great chamber. So, well, in fact, it was um, unsuccessful. And you have to say that um, compared to the GCHQ, Sweden and Germany's efforts are laughable. <laughs> So, Mike, one, your question, please. Well, thank you for the presentation. My question would be, how will Brexit affect the GCHQ situation? It will not, because um, there, this is a um, treat. Um, this is a treaty that has nothing to do with Brexit. And um, so far, um, Great Britain has complied very well with European decisions. So the question would be, how will this whole uh, mass data carousel go on? And de Maizière, our for, uh, former um, ministers, said 
that the old um, catalog of uh, questions that was still written by Schnarrenberger to the British um, government that has never been answered. So I don't think that there will be any changes. There will not be any large legal um, decisions because um, I think there is not a reprosecuted um, relation. Mike, for your question, please. Thanks again for the great presentation. In the last slide about the encrypted and unencrypted traffic, what is the remaining 9%? Well, that's years. So in 2017, we have 51% and 49% unencrypted. So I don't, I don't know what um, that is supposed to mean, actually. If you know about Sandwine, I think that they can make a clear statement about um, this number. But they had a description on these. Um, I, I would have to recalculate it, so I can't um, say anything about that right now. So maybe there's a different category, like um, <laughs> encrypted but not enough. I don't know. Encrypted but not a problem for secret services? I don't know. So I didn't notice that either. Mike 5, your question, please. So this complex interaction between the European Union and the national governments, is that going to work in our favor or against us overall? What's your impression? Oof. That's a tough call. That's a tough question. My impression is that, well, so in the EU, there is Julian King, who's responsible as a commissioner um, to, well, I, I find this difficult to find, like, come to a definitive conclusion in this case, this question. The European Parliament has clearly in their, in their, um, in their committees, um, they obviously have, have done a lot of work. I was there in one of the committees once. I find this difficult to, to respond to this question. I also think that the surveillance, like secret services, are not going to care about this, to be honest. Thanks a lot. I do think it was. Well, I think the biggest problem is that we do not have a European public that is discussing this. This is often a national debate rather than um, it's it's um, based on national law and it's a national case. And I, I, I think the issue is that and I even found that in Strasbourg with the journalists that the British journalists that come for the British case and the German journalists come for the German case. It's a little bit different with the European court right now, but... I don't think we have a debate across the borders. And I think Germany is maybe because, due to its history, most critical of its own secret service. Um, I have a question that I'm kind of aiming for what we've seen here, this kind of encryption. And how far can encryption lead... Well, well, can can prevent mass surveillance, basically, is what I would like to know. Well, this is very simple to answer because um, a large amount of the filters would be useless because you can't spy onto the content when uh, content that's being sent is being sent encrypted, and that's obviously like just kind of ends in the bottomless pit. Um, it's quite quite useful, and um, I do think it's it's good to see that the bigger platforms are introducing it. I mean, Facebook, uh, Gmail didn't really realize that that was going on, but but a lot of large tech companies, on a standardized basis, are now encrypting their communication, and that's really important. I want to um, have a follow-up question on this, please. Um, and how far is it um, possible that? 
hopefully now that there's more encryption, that there is going to be more laws now that are then going to um, basically undo this sort of encryption. Well, this sort of this is kind of like a going dark debate. That's a discussion that's been held in the US also over eight or nine years. Well, now it's called responsible encryption debate and um, encryption only if it if it really is done so responsibly and when it matters. So I think this war in this fight is quite in the middle. There's a co few companies like Australia, they have uh, law cases and, and, and so uh, it's also a 5 eye country, so that's why this matters quite a bit. But if I look into the current debate uh, about ransomware and, and this sort of stuff, um, and, and, and Trojans and, and that sort of stuff, so I think the image of, um, of these secret services has become more and more important. And I mean, de Maizière had had kind of said that we do need encryption, but we still have this debate of going dark and what secret service can do to look into these things regardless of whether or not something was encrypted. And I don't see us going the way that Australia has taken. Um, I do think that the countries with large technical infrastructure are gonna be the countries that matters more than the national debate here. I think we have to fight. I mean, like, I, I don't want to stand here as, a sh as like a following sheep. Like, um, I do think that we need to raise our voices, especially us. Like, th yes, they make decisions, but we can comment on it. And I think we, that's our responsibilities. Like, banning encryption is ridiculous. Well, thank you very much. I'm not gonna like say any news, right? I didn't like. Microphone number one, please. Is that an aluminium hat? Yes, it is. <laughs> I hope it's okay um, to uh, give an answer to a question before. That was so. There's sum of percentages. So the last ones are emerged are emerging ones. So they're not classified yet. But I did take a good guess. No. Thank you very much. Microphone number four. Is that related to your aluminium hat? <laughs> Hi, thank you, thank you, for Hi uh, thank you so much for your activism. So those control mechanisms that you were talking about. So in Germany, we have um, the um, office that is um, responsible for data protection. Um, is your impression that they have more leeway here so to actually um, do this checking mechanism in a, in a responsible way. Well, in, in Germany, it's it's a bit like there's a few different levels. So there is the BND that has their own data protection officer. Uh, she came to the parliament and, and did uh, hold a long speech in the parliament, and she obviously isn't in line with the BND all the time. And there's like another um, um, committee that, that um, does the controlling of, of, going, of surveillance. Um, and the issue with is that by the end of their contracts they are bound they have they, they have an NDA so they can't speak about uh, what was going on and um, so I do think that's not a surprising and that members of these committees and um, and this sort of stuff that that advised uh, on these committees uh, will basically refer to these committees and proceedings as fairy tales um, um, I, I read a few things that were that were quite useful from these control mechanisms, but it doesn't matter that the, this, these, these control mechanisms can only rely on what's lawfully being regulated. So that you can see in Sweden and Great Britain, there's the, if there's no law um, on how somebody can technically uh, control and c these kind of mechanisms, then what are they actually controlling? Like, th are they allowed to filter? What kind of filter technologies are they allowed to use? So then checking this kind of mechanism and controlling it is, is going to be easier. So, so there's this Kurt Kraulich. Um, he, I mean, he copied over a bunch um, of files from uh, proceedings and then presented it in Parliament. Um, but if you if you look at this in the European comparison to Great Britain, it's, it's I think in Germany we're, we're somewhere in the middle. We fall somewhere in the middle. Um, I do think as controllers, it's hard that they can't talk to one another and they can't really exchange 
um, what works well. And I mean, like this example of Steinmeier is, is I, I, I chose this example not by accident. Like the head of who is supposed to control the BND. And he doesn't know what's going on there. I think that like I've never seen this sort of like uh, this is just unbelievable that um, the office that's basically under his reign, he has no idea what's going on. It's like what the heck? <laughs> I see. I mean, there's a bunch of problems, but now I'm starting to rant, so I'm going to uh, stop at this point. Microphone number three, your question, Hello. please. Hi. Um, so I have the que following question. I'm German, and therefore these filters should be applied to me. Wouldn't it be a bigger problem to give this data to England and for them I'm a foreigner and they can basically store this data? And should there ever be any questions about me or my person, the BND is just going to go and ask the GAs HQ? Or like what kind of this? Well, yes, this is the data carousel that we're talking about. I mean, there's a bunch of examples that we can find in the Snowden papers. And and there's, there's ways and there's, there's little legal le loopholes that you can get through and of course, yeah, they passed on some raw data, but in the future that's obviously never going to happen again. I mean, I would recommend to only use uh, .de email addresses. I mean, I better be on the safe side here. Okay. Um, All right. Microphone number six, your question. There is email encryption, guys, mm, just on a side note. Based on the, the lawful rulings, what kind of consequences have we seen so far? Well, that's obviously a very complex question. There's been a lot of different rulings, and the consequences are quite, they, they differ quite a lot. And I'm going to give an example that a lot of you know. So there's two rulings from Strasbourg. So the preventative detention um, was a ruling that was done uh, by Strasbourg and then uh, once that ruling was passed, uh, the German uh, government basically um, appealed that and, and ruled it as lawful. Um, I mean, everybody kind of signed uh, the European uh, human, uh, the human rights, but um, there is a difference of signing and then actually abiding by those. And I mean, I'm always a bit surprised. There's a lot of academic papers that look at, over the decades, um, how rulings were um, actually being applied afterwards and implemented. So in Karlsruhe, I, I see this as well. I mean, the acceptance the pol of political, of highest court orders are, are, are kind of losing weight. So they're, they're losing importance. So when I look at the first ruling against the, straight tro against the state Trojan horse, um, the current like inner minister like didn't stand there. It was like, oh, so there's this judge who's like taken our weapons out of our arms. Like I don't think that happened. Like I think what changed it changed quite a bit. Like this attitude towards this sort of ruling. And I think we have to stand behind those rulings. And because they, if, if we find that they are rightful and uh, important. But I think I said this three times now. Signal Angel, a question from the internet. How long is the question and answer session of this? <laughs> I have a very short question. Oh, but I'm not going to be able to respond in like short. So what is meant by the G10 filter? And is that the G... So the G10 filter is part of the 10th um, law in our constitutional rights, which... Okay, so basically, German communication is supposed to be taken out of this kind of phishing and interception because the BND is not allowed to uh, listen in on German communication on German grounds. 
So the G10 filter is the technical term for referring to this. And um, so this is the one that is also was also tested by Kurt Graulich, this uh, special um, investigator. Thank you so much. Mike for last question, please. All right, thank you so much also from, from my side uh, that you um, are like so... Um, so bound on uh, going to court and, and, and filing complaints, I think that's brilliant. I have one question about um, encryption and how um, how we can like neg the Secret Service a little bit and they're not going to forbid encryption completely. Um, so the right-wing extremism, there's, there's something that was going on just very recently about right-wing extremism that he's trying to get to. It's about what happens on certain servers. Um, so there was this stuff um, before Christmas. Like I didn't look, I, I looked at the, at the draft for this law where they want to get to passwords. Um, for, um, yeah, but I don't think this is, has much relation to um, secret service surveillance. Um, I, I do think that this is, I mean, obviously, like, um, when it came to this ruling, like, um, they also talked about um, the criminal um, investigations, but criminal investigations aren't actually secret service investigations. So um, the way that this was introduced, this draft that was just released, I don't think that's going to actually pass any. Um, and I mean, like, obviously, like, we've seen that unconstitutional laws are actually being waved through sometimes, but um, they're always going to be successful fully um, tackled. And I don't think they're going to pass through Parliament. I do think that we are reaching another phase um, in le legislature because they have to um, hurry up before the new elections to push certain things through. But I don't think that this is going to pass this way. Um, I do. I mean, I mean, who knows? Seehofer is still there. Um, but maybe then you can like uh, file a complaint. And uh, she's like, no, no, I, I can't. I have enough to do. I have enough. I have a full plate. Um, I do think that in Germany, like um, constitutional complaints, there's a lot of people who do it and who are strategically filing these kind of complaints and who are very successful. Um, there's a lot of people who are... Um, I'm sorry, but um, so in Strasbourg, now that I've talked about Strasbourg and Karlsruhe, like, I'm a very big supporter of um, not fighting this in just in Karlsruhe. Like, I do think that this, that our constitution should be defended within parliament. Like, I don't think this is something that should be fought in the courts. Like, this is not the place where this should take place. All right, now I, I shot myself in the foot, haven't I? <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you also for having the patience and answering to all the questions. Thank you also for listening in.